From Microbe TV, this is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 24, recorded on November 22nd, 2021. Rack and Yellow, and you're listening to the podcast all about the nervous system. Joining me today from New York University, Tim Chung. Hi, everyone. Hi, Vincent. Good to be back again. Just uh, once a month. It goes by very quickly, though. <laughs> it's scarily quickly, yes. And it is just Tim and I today. So we have one uh, neuroscience student and a virologist who knows nothing about neuroscience, only destroys neurons with viruses, but uh, we should be okay because we have two guests today <laughs> who are going to talk about some cool work they have done uh, from New York University School of Medicine, Robert Fremke. Welcome to TWIN. Hi, thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. And from Rutgers University, Joanna Karcha. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Good to be here. So Rutgers in Piscataway, is that right? I'm at the Newark campus. Newark. Uh, yeah. Newark. Actually, one of the <laughs> campuses in Newark. I'm at the medical school in Newark. Uh, I've been yeah. there. I've been there. Yeah, there used to be some virology there years ago, yeah. Well, I... I, I think it's still going, though. Huh? No? Yeah. <laughs> I, I lost touch. I don't know. But I know I used to... I, I, I would go and give a seminar, and then they would take me to dinner in the Ironbound section, which was always nice, right? Great food Yeah, there. it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Really nice. Portuguese food. Yeah, Mostly. Portuguese, that's right, yeah. And uh, these days I, I pass through Newark every day because I take the train and I have to change at Newark. <laughs> so I'm always there. All right, we, we're going to talk about a nice paper that you guys have published recently. But before we do that, let's uh, hear a little about, a bit about your histories. Let's start with uh, you, Robert. Uh, where are you from originally? Sure. Um, well, from way back, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Mm. Um, and I went to art school for about a year in Boston <laughs> before uh, becoming a computer scientist. Uh, that was my undergraduate degree from Tufts. I worked for a bit at Columbia and then did my PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. I did postdoc work at the University of California, San Francisco. And I started my lab here at NYU in the Skirball and Neuroscience Institutes back in 2010. When you were a PhD student, did you do neuroscience already? Oh, yeah. 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 So um, neuroscience was just sort of becoming a field unto itself with like official graduate programs mm -hmm. around them. So my PhD technically is molecular and cell biology, um, but I was in a, in a neuro lab working for uh, young Dan before doing my postdoc work. Got it. Joanna, where are you from? Originally from Romania. Yeah. Um, a city called Yash in Northeast Romania. Um, that's where I, uh, you know, started my uh, interest in science. Um, I first went to med school. Um, it's um, one of the things that are different between uh, the European system and the American system, that after high school, you can go directly to med school. And so that's what I did. That mm. was my choice at the time. And then... Um, I decided I wanted to research and um, applied for a PhD program at Mount Sinai in New York. And um, I, I did my PhD with Dr. Diana Benson there. And then I moved to Rob's lab at NYU, where I did my postdoc, my postdoctoral training. And when did, so uh, I've been in the region for <laughs> some time a long now. Time. When did you move to Rutgers? You want to I was the first postdoc to join my group. Yes. Oh, cool. When did oh, you wow. move, when did you move to Rutgers? Twenty eighteen. I started September twenty eighteen. Okay. You had a little time yeah. before things shut down then, right? Uh, a little. I don't know if <laughs> enough for Yeah, right. You know. It, it was kind of a shock, I guess, for everyone, but uh, especially for new PIs. It's a shock even for us virologists, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Weren't uh we weren't prepared. That's the problem. So this um, Nature paper just published uh, in August of this year. Oxytocin neurons enable social transmission of maternal behavior. So you're, Joanna, you're the first author. And so this is your postdoctoral work, right? Yes. Um, this is 
uh, sort of the second uh, project of my postdoc, I would say, Rob, right? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So I started working on it um, somewhere mid my postdoc. And um, as it goes, you know, uh, <laughs> I, it, it needed some work after I left um, <laughs> and after I started my own lab. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's basically my last uh, postdoctoral paper. Nice. Um, all right. And you so, can see from the author list that uh, part of Iwana's job was to corral uh, many people yeah. uh, and kind of coordinate effort uh, across different groups and different labs, different faculty members. It's amazing. I, yeah. I just admi- I admire that because I was never good. I just had papers with a few people on them. <laughs> mm. It's a lot easier. To I do. think. I think if I understand correctly, some of the some of the tasks involved in getting the paper out requires a lot of uh, video scoring, which probably requires a lot of people. Because mm-hmm. one of the authors, um, Grace, uh, on the paper yes. is an, actually now working in the Kang Lab, w- w- of which I'm a member. Um, oh, so that, that's work. actually it's small. <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I, was, I saw this paper. I was like, oh, one of these names looks familiar. Oh, this is yeah. an interesting paper. Yeah, so so Gracie, you're right. Gracie was one of the many scorers um, that we had mm. uh, for the many, many, many hours of uh, video that we recorded um, um, animal behavior. And um, we initially, I mean, for this paper, we did it all manual, like it was manual scoring, right? Um, now we're trying to move to more automated uh, ways of scoring behavior. But yes, it took many, many people and it's not easy work. You know, it's kind of tedious, but uh, people like Grace who were very good at it. So the, the data collection began in 2014. Mm. This paper really was wow. the greater part of a decade. And about halfway through, there was a, kind of a revolution in the analysis of behavioral experiments, uh, basically moving from kind of an old school, um, you know, hand scoring, hand analysis approach to using new machine learning, computer vision based methods for automating behavior analysis. Hmm. So maybe before yeah, we uh, jump into the, the data, maybe you could give us a little primer on, you know, what, what is the biological problem that we're studying here? There are sort of two problems that went kind of hand in hand that form really the the two pillars that this paper is about. Uh, One is about animal behavior, and the other is about this uh, amazing molecule called oxytocin. Um, So um, maybe I'll start with the the molecule first. Oxytocin is uh, pretty famous. I'm guessing uh, many listeners uh, or watchers out there will will know about this. It's sort of most famous for its role in um, in, um, milk ejection, uh, in nursing and in childbirth. Uh, oxytocin is Pitocin, it's the same thing. Mm. And so a lot of women who go into labor um, will get Pitocin um, as a means to kind of um, speed up the birthing process and induce uterine contractions. Oxytocin is on the, the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines because of its important and you know, well kind of established and trusted role in helping, um, in helping you know, uh, women give birth. Actually, in, in, in Greek, it means fast birth, right? Sorry to interrupt, but that's exactly what Oh, stands wow. for. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the history of the, the discovery of oxytocin is a fascinating story in, in, in its own right. Getting back to over 100 years, if not for a long time, hmm. in terms of basically the search for natural medicines or compounds that can, that can help the birthing process. Um, is the- Sorry, quick question. So, is the is its action on birthing um, an effect on the brain or in the peripheral uh, system? Right. So, uh, oxytocin is uh, nine amino acids. It's a tiny little peptide. Um, it's made in the brain, uh, largely in kind of a deep center part of the brain called the hypothalamus. Um, it's made by a bunch of different neurons in different subregions of the hypothalamus. Um, the region that we studied was called the paraventricular nucleus, but the hypothalamus. Most oxytocin is then sent out of the brain into the bloodstream where it acts directly 
say, on uh, on muscle on the uterus to induce uterine contractions, or it acts in uh, mammary tissue to basically uh, help uh, the milk uh, uh, come out during nursing. Um, but uh, over the last, I'd say, maybe three decades or so, um, and a, a long list of people have been involved in, in these discoveries, there's been an appreciation that oxytocin is also important for acting in the brain for various aspects of social behavior, pair bond formation, mother-infant bonding. Um, but although, um, you know, actually uh, still a lot of mysterious about how those neurons fire, where oxytocin goes, and then what oxytocin does to maybe, you know, make uh, people or animals pay more attention to the, the social scene. Um, so that was one half of it. Uh, the other half, uh, and, and then you want if you want to win on, on your perspective too. Mm -hmm. um, the other half of this is just trying to understand how it is that animals become parents. Mm. You know, how much of parenting is an instinct, and how much is or, or can be or must be sort of learned on the job. Um, and in our case, in this paper, we were studying um, mice, lab mice, and how lab mice become mothers. One really interesting thing about uh, parenting, it's true for mice, it's true for people too, is that non-biological parents can be amazing parents themselves. Um, in particular, if we take a, a virgin female mouse and we put her in the cage with an experienced mom and her babies, the virgin will become a co-parent. Um, that might take a few hours, it might take a few days. Almost all animals do it, maybe not every single animal, but most animals will do it. Hmm. And so the other half of this paper then was basically using essentially the, the tools of documentary filmmaking to watch what happens in the, you know, that, that, that home cage, that apartment that these animals are all living in, how the virgin herself becomes a co-parent and what, if anything, oxytocin has to do. Mm -hmm. So is it, um, sorry, sorry, I'm just wondering, so the, the bulk of this paper looks at this uh, phenomenon called alloparenting, which is, as you said, uh, parenting of a, uh, uh, a, a pup, mouse pup, or someone's child who is not your own. Mm -hmm. um, is it is it something that is well seen out? I know, yes. for example, in humans, there's a lot of, of babies. It's essentially, well, I think of it as babysitting. I don't know whether oh, yeah. we can project Everything, that to Babysitting mom. or the school system, you know, the uh, having grandparents watch your kid or right, right. things like that. Uh, they can all be considered very... Uh, <laughs> high-level um, types of alloparenting. But um, it is uh, quite spread in nature, this alloparenting behavior. Um, there's many species of mammals that, uh, that take advantage of this um, possibility of having others care for their uh, offspring, for their pups. Birds as well um, seem to do it. And I think um, the more we understand animal behavior in the wild, the, the more examples of this we will find, you know. Um, but if you if you look at um, pretty much any of, uh, not any, but some of, some of uh, the documentaries on nature, like uh, Planet Earth, I think David Attenborough's, right, movies, you'll, you'll find their examples of yellow parenting, uh, you know, I, I, there's some primates taking care of um, some, you know, the baby of another primate, things like that. Sometimes it can happen even across species, which is fascinating. Yeah, there's a lot of viral videos on YouTube of like, yeah. like a cheetah <laughs> babysitting a lamb and that kind of stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it is, I would say it is... Um, very much present in, in nature, in the wild, in many species. So, well, from our perspective as neuroscientists, right, these things that involve animal behavior have to involve the brain in some way. I think anybody, I mean, you know, I think everyone can appreciate nature specials, animal documentaries. Um, and um, what we do then is we kind of, sort of use sort of the tools of contemporary neuroscience um, combined with ways of studying animal behavior try to understand the, the neural circuits and the molecules and the genes 
that uh, help generate these important and complex patterns of behavior. Um, you can imagine something like parenting is extremely complex. And so that for us was one of the things that um, really this, this paper was about. And I think it helped kind of unlock uh, the secrets of what the oxytocin neurons were doing in this paper. Uh, initially, virgin female mice uh, are kind of pup shy. Maybe just like any kind of teenager who hasn't been a babysitter, or doesn't have younger siblings, right? They tend to shy away from, from babies. Um, but uh, we discovered in the course of these studies that the experienced mother essentially conscripted or made the virgin female be a co-parent. Um, and um, it was sort of that co-housing manipulation, the fact that the virgin animal had no experience with babies, was averse to the pups, and that there was a time zero we could begin the experiments and sort of watch continuously, you know, in real time with 24-7 videography, every single thing that these animals did and how they all interacted um, to identify those, you know, those special moments where animals might change their behavior and maybe even learn. We're, we're really kind of looking for, I guess, social needles in a haystack, so to speak. You know, um, we, so we, we do... We use mice for virus experiments, and some time ago we had a problem where <clears throat> but you put two females in a male in a cage. One of them gets pregnant. You take the other two out, and then when the mother had babies, she would eat them all. So the animal husbandry people said, leave the other female in, and that got rid of the problem. Is Maybe it's related, right? It could be. It could be. Uh, it could it might uh, be related to this um, sharing of the burden to yeah. take care of pups, right? Um, I mean, w one of the behaviors that we describe in the in the paper is this shepherding behavior, where um, the dam, the experienced animal, kind of forces the other one to to come to the nest with pups and stay with pups, and um, we believe that. Um, the mother does this in order to increase the chances of survival for her pups. Um, because at this age, you know, during the first week of life, um, the pups cannot maintain their body temperature at all. They're what's called poikiothermic. And so if they are just left in the nest by themselves, eventually they will die from just being cold. Um, and so the mother, you're bringing this other animal in, um, can keep them warmer for longer, especially if she has, you know, a large leader, right? Can keep them, can keep the pups warm and can also give herself some, some time to go eat and drink and do other things. So um, it, it, what you're describing could be, you know, like a shared responsibility for, for the pups. I know this was not part of your study, but do the males have any role to play at all in this? We uh, we didn't have males in the okay. in the co-housing, but we did separately um, um, more recently some some pilot testing where we had the mother and the father um, in the in the cage with pups, and um, we noticed the the males don't shepherd that much, Oops. but but they are willing to um, stay in the nest. They they are willing to bring pups back to the nest if they get scattered. Um, they are willing. <laughs> they do it. Um, I don't know if willingly, willingly or not, <laughs> but but they do that. Obviously, they're not going to nurse, right? Uh, but one um, important thing to note on the uh, male issue is that these have to be fathers or, you know, they have to to be within a certain time after they mate in order to be okay with pups, to take care of them, to uh, protect them. If they're virgin males, they're going to eat the pups or they're going to attack them. So, so, um, so something also changes in the, in the father. For, <clears throat> sorry, something changes in the father so that they know they are the father and they should, uh, yes. they should yes. do some parenting. Yes. Yeah, and there's, there's fantastic work from Catherine Dulac yeah. at Harvard looking at what happens uh, basically male mice, what happens with mating. Um, there's a whole separate set of changes, but also kind of 
rely on this part of the brain called the hypothalamus, although maybe not, okay. you know, ex- explicitly oxytocin. Is. So oxytocin That's- is not made by males, is that right? Oh, it is. Uh-huh. Um, it's just that oxytocin might have um, different roles in males and females. Um, oxytocin is, a, in addition to being a peptide, it's a sex hormone. And so like the action of other hormones, there can be some sex-specific effects. I mean, of all, kind of all the things that could be you know, sex-specific, especially for parenting, uh, nursing and giving birth are basically the top two at the top of the list, right? Um, yeah. And so it's no surprise maybe then that oxytocin uh, would, might have different roles in males and females. But oxytocin is definitely in the male brain. Males can definitely be good parents. Um, it's just there might be sort of separate brain mechanisms that involve these things. I'm glad to hear that males can be good parents. Someone should have told me that before I had kids, you know. <laughs> I, mean, I think we're here to, to tell that to all your listeners. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so maybe you so, can um, tell us the sorry. experimental setup, the video and, and monitoring that uh, gave yeah. you the initial data. <clears throat> but, yeah. yeah, for example, like when we, I've been saying babysitting, but like what does babysitting look like in mice? How do you know these virgin females who have never seen a pup before? How are they getting better at taking care of them? Mm. So we test them. We test them before we start the experiment. Um, The major test we use is called pup retrieval, um, where we basically have uh, the animal to be tested, in this case the virgin, in a cage with um, pups. Um, and then we separate one pup at a time from the nest and uh, we let the virgin do what she wants. <laughs> and if they, uh, um, if they are maternal, they're going to pick up the pup in their mouth and uh, take it back to the nest. That's what mothers do every time, you know, with every pup that we try. Um, and very quickly, they pick them up, bring them back to the nest. Um, Virgin mice initially don't do that. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of have a cutoff time at two minutes. If they don't do it in two minutes, we consider that, that they don't retrieve. And um, we do this 10 times and we see, you know, what is the rate of retrieval? And that would be for us a good measure to, to determine how maternal the animal is. And then we start the co-housing. Um, and... I would just want to add to what Rob said earlier that I think the the um, big advantage that we had for this um, paper and for the line of research that's um, going on in Rob's lab is that um, we sort of replicated um, uh, ethological uh, social habitat, right? Like a sort of like a colony in the wild. We have a... Um, small version of that in our co-housing. So in the wild, uh, mice living colonies, generally it's like one male and then several females. One of them is a re- reproductive female and the others are all the daughters of that female, but they don't reproduce necessarily. And so we took just like two adults like that and tried to reproduce like a more um, yeah, natural habitat for them. Um, social habitat. And that allowed us to see behaviors that we would not see um, in the more classical laboratory conditions. So we put the the mother, the virgin, and the pups um, in the cage. We give them access to food and water and sufficient uh, bedding material, sufficient nesting material. And um, we videotape the the whole co-housing from a camera on top of the cage. And uh, we also have microphones to pick up uh, ultrasonic vocalizations. Mice generally like to communicate via um, high pitch sounds that we cannot hear. And uh, is so we that, have- is that, when, is that when they're, because when I pick mice up, they, they, they scream in a frequency that I can hear and then they bite me. So, <laughs> so, it's, so it's, it's a special communications between mice that they use. Um, yeah, so there are all kinds of different vocalizations these animals make. Um, infant mice, pups, tend to make three types of calls that have been documented in, in the literature. Um, one are 
audible pain cries that you and I can hear. Um, and then the other two types of calls are called wriggling calls and distress calls. Wriggling calls are generally made when the animal is in the nest and um, wants to nurse. Um, and um, the isolation calls are made when the animal is out of the nest, uh, probably isolated, maybe the body temperature is cooling. These mice, kind of like human babies, are sort of always crying or vocalizing to some degree. It's just that when they're alone, they, they change their um, the acoustic statistics. Um, and there's a, an interesting temporal feature, also kind of analogous to human baby cries, which is the essence of the cry for the parenting behavior, which is sort of the wah, 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 rhythmicity of the call. Mm. And that repeated the kind of nature of it. It was like a special kind of time interval between all those little wah syllables. It seems to be the most important for making the mom find the pup with the sound and take it back to the nest. And importantly, um, uh, mice don't have to be kind of siblings or it doesn't have to be a mother-daughter relationship. That's animals true. will take care of other other animals' pups. This, this seems to be basically um, a, a, a system for child rearing in general. And maybe that's because in the wild, if you tend to be around pups, they're probably yours or related to you anyway. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then probably the, the final major component of this, um, if you want to talk about this, you want to, uh, was the neural recordings. This is one of the first times um, we've been able to record directly from identified oxytocin neurons. Mm -hmm. And those recordings were made during this cohabitation procedure to look at the, the behavioral episodes or interactions that led to you know, activating, making these oxytocin neurons fire and release oxytocin. <laughs> yes, there was uh, there was key. So we um, we use this technique called optical tag recordings um, to identify which cells in the hypothalamus are oxytocin secreting, and um, to do that we worked with transgenic animals. That so the virgins were transgenic animals that uh, expressed um, a light sensitive ion channel, chernodopsin in oxytocin cells specifically. And um, these animals were implanted with uh, electrodes and also a fiber optic. And so we recorded action potentials, you know, the uh, activity of e individual cells. And at the end of each co-housing day, we would um, stimulate with blue light, just briefly, you know, just a couple of pulse, couple of <laughs> several pulses of blue light. Um, and the cells that we saw responding very robustly um, to this blue light were the ones expressing channel dopsin and therefore were the ones secreting oxytocin. So it, it's a little bit of a, a you know elaborate technique, but very useful in uh, us identifying exactly which yeah. cells we're recording from. Actually, for the benefit of the audience, maybe I'll go a little bit deeper into this optotagging technique because it really is quite fascinating and it, I think it's changing neuroscience quite a bit mm -hmm. if, 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 it's, if you can pull it off, which I understand it's difficult. <laughs> yes. but, um, but for example, in the paraventricular nucleus of the thalamus where you, um, you're recording from, um, oxytocin neurons aren't the only type of neurons in there. Um, if I understand correctly, for example, That's there right. are also... Um, uh, cortisol releasing hormones still? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's yes. CRH neurons. Yes. I can't, can't remember what CRH stands for. Something to do with cortisol and the stress hormone. And um, in fact, I think one of the previous twin, um, the team talked about these uh, CRH releasing neurons that somehow indirectly project to the spleen and can make antibodies um, when, when the mouse becomes stressed. So it's kind of a stress-mediated uh, immune response. Um, and so these different types of neurons, if you were to just stick an electrode into the uh, paraventricular nucleus of the thalamus, you would get uh, firing from all these types of neurons. So mm -hmm. one way of telling them apart, and because we're mainly interested in oxytocin neurons because of all the background we've given about oxytocin importance in nursing and, and um, potentially parenting and, and pair bonding, um, you really want to look at the oxytocin neurons. So one way of doing it is to express a light-gated uh, channel that is 
genetically driven to only express in oxytocin neurons. And if I understand correctly, at the end of the day or at the end of the experiment, all you need to do is shine a light to trigger pulses. And those neurons who respond back with a pulse with a very low frequency, uh, sorry, not low, low latency, so it mm -hmm. tells you that it is responding to the light very quickly, those are the oxytocin neurons. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, so the hypothalamus, I think, has remained one of the most mysterious and kind of muddy brain regions. And only recently have people begun to kind of make progress in understanding what different uh, subsectors of it, what, of it do. Unlike the cortex, which seems to be divided up into different functional areas related to vision or hearing, or maybe, you know, higher cognition or, or, or movement, methalamus really is kind of this big jumble of cells. Um, but really over the last decade or so, a, a lot of different groups, um, Scott Sternson, Brad Lowell, David Anderson, Catherine Duloc, have been able to identify, seem like it's maybe on order a dozen different major cell types that have all kinds of different functions related to really kind of core physiological processes, um, protection of, of nutrient need, make you feel hungry or thirsty. Mm -hmm. um, parts of the hypothalamus are involved in um, various aspects of social behavior, aggression, mating. Um, stress, as Tim mentioned, yeah. Stress, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, is, it, is it fair to describe a lot of innate behavior or is that too too uh, straightforward a description? Well, I think that that's kind of one thing our paper is sort of really about is to kind of drill down on that phrase, innate behavior, and ask what aspects might really be innate what, and um, what aspects um, could be learned or sort of have to be learned on the job. And I think we, it really takes this sort of 24-7 videography approach to understand exactly all the experiences animals have. If you miss, um, you know, some important or potentially very brief moment, it might look like, you know, this animal is doing something out of the blue, um, whereas there could be a lot of very fast learning. You know, for, for example, um, if somebody was trying to understand where my parenting behavior came from, and just didn't happen to record 90 seconds when I learned how to change a diaper for the first time when my son, <laughs> my first son was born. It might look like I had this innate ability to change diapers because, you know, if they measure how well I do it, I'm doing it 100%. And where I was doing it at 0%, I've never done it before. Of course, there's no innate diaper changing circuit in my brain. There's just really, really fast learning coupled with an urgency to do something with this, this crying infant. And I think a lot of the maybe feelings that we have um, are or could be innate. Certainly, I think the sound of a crying baby, everybody has a feeling about that, right? Whether or not you're a parent or an alloparent, a babysitter, or a sibling, if you hear a crying baby, that, that baby cry is obnoxious. It's just an obnoxious sound. It almost seems designed by, you know, the mechanisms of evolution to be exactly, you know, the, the most obnoxious, grating sound. And it has to, <laughs> right? it has to wake up a parent from deep sleep, maybe from across a room or across a, a house. Um, and so the, um, the quality, or if you will, qualia of that sound might be something that's innate. That's a really fascinating kind of important concept. But what somebody does with that sound, with that stimulus, if they decide to ignore it, or if they decide to move away from it, or if they decide to uh, approach whatever is making that sound. Well, now we're talking about things that are kind of learned from experience, and there have to be aspects of motor learning, how delicately to pick up uh, an infant child, an infant human, you know, an infant mouse pup, if you're, if you're a mouse mom, especially if you're using your mouth to do that. And a lot of that motor control uh, almost certainly has to be learned uh, from experience. So... Yeah, I think there's a, a very old and ongoing debate um, in the fields of psychology and neuroscience um, on, you know, how much of our behaviors are innate or how much is innate and how much is learned, right? Uh, I don't think, <laughs> I think the debate is going to continue for a while, um, but um, uh 
perhaps, you know, one way to think of, of this is that there are no such thing as purely innate behaviors and purely learned behaviors. They, you know, there's like um, maybe contributions of both th- these mechanisms, but to different extents, depending on what behavior we're talking about. But um, yeah, it's it's an ongoing debate. <laughs> so the, this I think high- one important aspect of our work, though, is that parenting, regardless as to any kind of innate basis or you know component, might have parenting can be learned. And one of the I think interesting, maybe unusual observations we made in the paper is it seems to be learned visually by mice. Mice watch other mice, and there's something about what the more experienced mom mouse is doing that the, you know, soon to be co-parent mouse is learning by, uh, by watching. Yeah, that, that is, I mean, that's the crux of this paper, which is absolutely incredible, which is the, these, ba- these virgin mice who have never seen a baby before can learn to babysit, so to speak, learn to retrieve mice by watching the, the mum doing it. Um, yeah. But I thought uh, for the benefit of the audience, maybe before we go on to go to the brain recording and all this uh, and the learning uh, aspect, maybe just to recap the evidence that there is some sort of learning for, for, for the audience. So, um, Joanna, you found that, you know, through all this uh, recording of uh, the the mum mice together with the virgin mice for three, four days nonstop. Yeah. Um, you days. found that the, for four days, which, mm-hmm. which is quite long. Uh, <laughs> the pups are growing by that point. Um, yeah. That the virgin, the virgin female are getting better and better at retrieving uh, pups that you yourself and your team take out and they yes. would go and re- retrieve it. And that crucially depends on uh, the mum being there because if you were to co-house the virgin pups, uh, no, sorry, the virgin female just by themselves uh, without the mum. But with the pups. But with the pups, uh, you see a much uh, later onset of this retrieval behavior. Yes, yes, exactly. How much later? How many days without without a mom? Uh, Well, it's a difference of uh, about a day, a day and a half later uh, when they start retrieving. But even after that point, you know, they perform lower um, Mm. than than the cases. So Mm -hmm. the pups, do they survive in the case with a virgin mom or not? Yeah, we have a trick for that (laughs) because if we just uh, do it the same way, they would not, of course. They would uh, die of hunger. But... we rotate the pups. So it's, um, um, you know, we make sure that after, at the end of the day, uh, about 12 hours um, is the time when we change the, the pups with well-fed pups. And then we let those on for 12 hours and then we change them again. And um, so so that's uh, the trick to to deal with this uh, situation. But uh, yes, you're absolutely right. When the mother is present, the virgins start uh, retrieving faster and uh, they do it at higher rates. And yeah. Sorry, I just want to highlight, and and not only that, you have some clues from your documentary style recording that the mum is doing something. When the mum is there, she's doing something that might be triggering this... uh, this learning of retrieval, for example, the shepherding behavior where the whenever it's quite incredible, you can see in that you, you, you have this ethogram where it's mm-hmm. just plotting what the virgin mouse is doing and also what the mama is doing at any given moment of the day. And whenever it seems like whenever the virgin leaves the nest, uh, the mum kind of goes out and say, oh, no, you don't. You come back to the nest. And then they would, <laughs> it would come and grab the mouse, uh, grab the virgin mice and then kind of shove them back to the nest. And, yes. um, and, also, there are also some behavior you uh, highlighted that, for example, uh, sometimes a pup, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the reason, uh, so you yourself take the pup out of the nest and see if the uh-huh. virgin would bring it back. But sometimes um, the pup would be nursing on the mum and the uh-huh. mum would be going out of the nest, maybe to explore, maybe to feed, and the virgin goes with her, but then gets dropped halfway through. Yeah, and yeah, that- and and this is um, kind of what you call spontaneous retrieval. And when this happens, on certain occasions, the mum would, instead of bringing the pup back to the nest, would bring it to the virgin. So the virgin could be off doing 
outside the nest doing somewhere, some, somewhere else doing something. And the mom goes straight to the virgin, drop the pup <laughs> as if saying, can you do something about this? And the mom goes home, um, <laughs> which is quite incredible. And crucially, at, for some of these animals, Iwana was recording from oxytocin neurons during these events. There were also some dual recordings where she was recording from the oxytocin neurons and the auditory cortex, which is basically sort of the, the hearing part of the brain or one of them. Um, it's certainly a brain area that becomes sensitive to the crying baby sounds. And so kind of in the moment, sort of in real time, uh, we can see how the behavioral event, the shepherding or the mom retrieving the pup, demonstrating that in front of the co-care, how they would activate oxytocin neurons in the co house virgin. And then also in some cases, sort of watch kind of a surge of activity begin to emerge in that virgin's auditory cortex. Mm. So it's not simply the behavioral correlations, which are absolutely essential. It was uh, the neural recordings kind of um, yeah. lending weight to the fact that the behavioral episodes were, were doing anything meaningful in terms of change of the brain or you know, the mm -hmm. neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. But, but, but I'm guessing yeah, that the, sorry, yeah. so I'm guessing yeah, yeah. the behavior gives you a clue that something yes. might be learnable. Yeah, and we actually um, once we we did this cohousing experiments and we observed this spontaneous behaviors, um, we um, wondered, you know, to what extent can they contribute uh, to the virgin becoming maternal, right? And so we took the the case of the. Um, uh, pop lost on the way uh, and then retrieved, right? And took that outside of the of the co-housing procedure. So now we just had the virgin observe a mom repeatedly retrieving pops, um, you know, either uh, without any separation between them or across a transparent barrier. Um, so they're forced to watch without other kind of interaction. They're just what kind of like watching a movie. But Most of the time they will watch, you know, like animals are curious, <laughs> mice are curious. And so when uh, some, something happens on the other side, the pup cries, the mother moves, um, uh, the virgins are going to watch that. And we, we did uh, sort of eliminate trials when there was no watching and uh, didn't take those into account. But most of the time they, they do watch. And... Uh, yeah, we just exposed them to this repeated retrievals done by another animal. And then we tested to see whether their own retrieval improves. And it did. You know, even when we had a transparent barrier in the cage and they didn't have any touch, um, they only had access to visual information, to auditory information, and probably olfactory, some olfactory information at least, that, that's harder mm -hmm. to measure. Um, but yes, so uh, without any physical contact, they were able to learn from this. Um, we'll we think by observation to learn from this performance you know, of the mother. One of the, the fun things about this whole study over the you know, greater part of a decade we did this, as we started out, we had no idea if or what we might discover. Uh, actually, um, some of this is a, an odd consequence of Hurricane Maria. Um, we just had a lot of video we were collecting and, and trying to get neural recordings um, you know, several years ago. And uh, there have been a few technicians in the laboratory who have come from the University of Puerto Rico system, maybe for summer projects. But after the hurricane happened, um, a couple of students, uh, NYU basically helped kind of, you know, evacuate them from Puerto Rico and give them full-time jobs, even putting them up in the dorms. Um, and then we had, you know, a, a few people here um, who were kind of, paid full time and it just so happened we had all these videos uh, that someone needed to kind of watch and score. Um, one of these people, Joyce, was actually really experienced with mouse behavior, had seen some of this stuff before and done it before. Another person, Daniel, had no experience whatsoever. He was, he was a medical student. Um, and the two of them started going through the video and discovered this sort of shepherding phenomenon, which is now 
totally obvious. It happens mm -hmm. all the time, really hundreds mm -hmm. of times in the course of co-housing for pretty much every animal pair that we've, we've ever looked at. You know, if, if you were to take a look at the paper and watch the five or 10 second video clip, it would oh. sort of be obvious to you. First of all, with the behavior, it would be absolutely obvious. Just and want to quickly watching it. Yeah. Well, quickly add, the paper is open access, so any listeners want to go check out the videos, which is completely incredible because I have been working for mice for a few years now, and it is just virgin females co-housed together, never mums with virgin mm -hmm. females, and I've never seen this behavior. So when I first saw it, I was completely you yeah. know, mind blown. It's, it's, it's a very odd behavior to see. So does the activation of the oxytocin neurons in the virgin, does that happen with only shepherding behavior or any movement of the, the, the dam? Not any movement. Um, well, uh, we, we did look at, um, for this case, the control that we had was um, when the, the rare cases when uh, the mother would chase the virgin, not in the nest, but somewhere else in the cage, which happens very rarely, but that was uh, our control. So that, you know, virgins would still see the mother approaching, would uh, maybe have some physical interaction with her, but uh, the, uh, I guess the direction of the movement would not be towards pups. And so that seems to happen, which is like something very interesting and we need to follow up with that, you know, like, why this particular shepherding towards the the nest is um, definitely more um, more of a stimulus for oxytocin cells than other movements, other types of interactions with the dam. Interesting. And one one of the major questions in the field when we began was: Is there basically one set of oxytocin neurons that kind of does it all? Uh, they're sort of all activated during nursing to make sure that animals can nurse. Um, and maybe some of that system was sort of co-opted for changes in the brain, important for mother-infant or, or parent-child bonding. Um, or are there different subsets of oxytocin neurons, which can do very different kinds of jobs? And so Iwana's recordings really indicate it's the, more like the latter. There mm -hmm. are some neurons that seem to do uh, a few different jobs. And some of these neurons might also be the ones activated during um, uh, during nursing, if they were recording from biological moms. Um, but I think, you know, one of the major advances here at all is just that, uh, you know, even in a non-lactating animal, the oxytocin system is definitely sensitive, it's definitely activated and, and, and does things um, uh, in the promotion of, of parenting behavior. Actually, um, if I could dig a little into the oxytocin neuron firing uh, stories you have in the paper, um, you recorded from oxytocin neurons using the optotagging we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and you found um, in the case when the virgin female is behind a transparent screen watching the mum on the other side retrieving the pup, some oxytocin neuron fire. And then you tested later on that when the same virgin who, who has been observing now herself retrieved the pup the oh, yeah. same oxytocin neurons also fire. And in the paper you mentioned, this looks a bit like mirror neurons. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what mirror neurons are and how this uh, applies and what, what some of the implication might be. Yeah, um, the mirror neurons have been uh, initially, originally discovered in the prefront, pre, sorry, premolar cortex of uh, primates. And it was totally uh, by accident um, you know, the uh, researchers were recording neurons in this motor area uh, when the primate was doing a particular grabbing movement. And uh, then one of the experimenters made the same motion, grabbing motion, and the neuron responded the same way when uh, the monkey, the primate made the motion or the human made the motion. And so that's um, that's why they, they call them uh, mirror neurons. Uh, in that particular case and in follow-up studies, the motor movement was um, exactly the same, right? So that's why I, I would say that this term of mirror neuron is... Um, it makes perfect sense in the case, right? Like the way they approach the object, the way they grab the object, it was uh, very similar. 
in our case and in several other studies um, where kind of similar um, patterns of neural activity are reported, but for different behaviors, I don't know if we can really call these mirror neurons because um, the movement is probably unlikely to be the same or the, the exact sequence of the behaviors behavior is unlikely to be exactly the same, right? Uh, the way the mother is uh, retrieving the pup and the way the virgin is retrieving the pup are probably not going to be exactly the same. But um, we can call them sort of social maternal neurons, um, let's say. And um, yeah, there's been evidence of this um, social cells, let's say in the hippocampus as well. You know, hippocampus is famous for encoding place. There are these place cells. It seems that um, some of these hippocampal neurons don't only encode the position of the um, animal, um, I mean, the animal that where they're in, <laughs> but also the position of another animal that they're observing, right? So um, they call this social place cells. Um, so in our case, I think there, there is a resemblance resemblance to the mirror neural station, but I wouldn't call them exactly mirror cells. <laughs> now we didn't, uh, this is also a serendipitous uh, observation. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we certainly didn't set out to look at anything related to the mirror system. And if anything, this might even be sort of, you know, especially interesting because as you want to mention, these neurons can be abstracting away the details, the low level motor programs of pick up, pop, move, pop, drop, pop, seem to be kind of generalized to the, the, the basic principle of, you know, take a pup back to the nest or yeah. move into the nest. Hmm. Well, the experiment I like is when you knocked out the gene for the oxytocin receptor in the the virgins. Tell us, tell us what happens there. Um, when we knock out the oxytocin receptor, um, this has got to be the transparent barrier experiment. Oh, oh, the knockout mouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, we did work with the, the exactly, with mice that don't express the oxytocin receptor um, anywhere in the brain or the body. And we repeated the uh, behavior that we talked about mm. earlier where they're across the barrier, the transparent barrier. And we wanted to see if they can acquire uh, pup retrieval behavior the same way wild type animals do. And uh, we found that th they don't. Mm. There is a, there's a, a significant uh, decrease, slowdown in, um, in a, how uh, or whether they, they acquired this behavior at all. Some can, some of the animals still can, mm. but um, definitely the majority of them so do you, don't. If they can acquire the behavior without oxytocin receptor, what, what does that mean? That there's some other redundant system going on? There's, there's probably are uh, redundant systems for oxytocin. Um, I mean, if we if we think uh, even to the crucial role of oxytocin, uh, birthing, right? Mothers, um, mouse mothers, can give birth without the presence of the oxytocin receptor. And not all of them, again, but some of them can, and they're going to do it slower. They're going to do it like <laughs> it takes longer, right? It, um, that is something that we um, just observed in the lab in the colonies that we have. It takes longer. Some of them cannot, and some die in labor, actually. Um, but for some of them, it is still possible. So there might be some uh, developmental compensatory mechanisms for, for this. And, um, you know, the knockouts that we used were, were um, um, general knockouts, um, like not conditioned in, in any way. So they had this lack of oxytocin receptors since uh, conception, right? So there was plenty of time for the brain to adjust and come up with alternative uh, mechanisms. But to this point, to your point, um, when we do the same experiment, but um, in wild type mice, 
and we apply an antagonist of the receptor in the auditory cortex, we see a, a greater decrease in the capacity of these animals to acquire pop retrieval by, you know, observation in, in this setting, in this um, observation setting. So when we do a more acute uh, inhibition or blockage of the oxytocin receptors, that phenotype uh, becomes even more obvious. So, so just uh, digging into this a little bit, this is, we're coming to the final figure of the paper. Um, we'll, and this is actually, I found this quite fascinating because um, uh, uh, Rob's lab has been crucial in showing that oxytocin uh, neurons that come from the paraventricular nucleus that we've been talking about uh, so far sends projections to the auditory cortex. Um, and that this projection to the auditory cortex is crucial in uh, allowing pups core to be recognized, not, maybe not recognized, but maybe made more salient. Please correct me, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe made more salient to the mother or to these virgins who are learning how to babysit. Um, and what I found fascinating was that the uh, paper, I think this was a few, this is like maybe five years ago now, um, you, uh, your lab found that uh, the oxytocin is largely working through the left auditory cortex, not just both sides of auditory cortex. And this was fascinating for two reasons. It's because, of course, in humans, we know that most people are right-handed and therefore they have a bias for the left side of the brain being imposed, well, functional for doing things. Um, because the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. Um, so, whereas I don't know whether people know that mice have this kind of lateralization of brain function. And the second reason why this was quite exciting when I heard it was that it is also known that in human, uh, both speech production and speech recognition depends heavily on the left side of the brain. So, when I first heard that mice recognizing pup cores is on the left side of the brain. I was quite excited. I wonder if you could tell some of that story and is it, is it the emergence of, uh, of speech? So um, speech and language are among the most complex, you know, functions that the human brain forms. And so there are aspects of processing and production that are on the left side and on the right side. But uh, I would say that the kind of the first thing, maybe the first result, if you will, that founded neurology and, and, and then neuroscience was when people began surviving brain damage that was localized in different parts of the brain. Um, one of the just so stories is that basically this is due to the invention of the high speed rifle, where the bullet wounds would exit the head and were going so fast it would essentially help cauterize the wound. And people began surviving gunshot wounds to the head. And then the soon-to-be neurologists could assess function and, dam and uh, the consequences to people with damage to different brain areas. And one of the, the first observations was the damage to the left side was more impactful to language than on the right side. It turns out, if you sort of look across species, mammalian species, also some birds, there's a whole bunch of lateralized functions, especially when it comes to recognizing the sounds made by members of your own species. I remember having a, a dinner with uh, the chair of Wecker Psychology a while back and talking about this work. And he told me he just read a paper about uh, sea lion mothers returning uh, with fish to their pups and they would lead with their right ear out of the water. This is my right. Um, indicating that there was a right ear, left hemisphere advantage for recognizing the sound of crying sea lion babies. And there's a whole bunch of interesting and peculiar studies in, in different animals, including like pandas and such, asking about laterality and ear preference for, for sounds made by species versus um, just kind of innocuous sounds. Uh, so it does just relate the observation, and we've taken this further looking at different patterns of gene expression on the left side and on the right side in males and females. Um, much of this work is sort of ongoing in the lab now. Um, kind of just like with shepherding, maybe similar to the mirror neuron-esque aspects of these oxytocin neurons. The laterality was uh, axonal discovery also, but it seemed that 
many aspects were sort of left lateralized. Oxytocin receptor expression is left lateralized in the mouse female cortex. Response to baby cries are left lateralized. The left hemisphere is more important than the right hemisphere. Um, and so, and there are actually something on the order of 200, 250 genes that seem to be overexpressed in female left auditory cortex. And so going forward now, we have a whole bunch of puzzle pieces to try to put together to understand how maybe some kind of, back to this question about innateness, especially for the sounds the babies make. Um, is there some innate bias the left hemisphere has towards recognizing, detecting and recognizing these cries? Is that in some way helpful for new parents to kind of quickly get their own abilities up and running to take care of babies kind of across the whole breadth of cues that infants make to indicate different aspects of infant need. How do those molecular uh, uh, components lead to changes in single neuron function and network function and thus produce a, a coherent and maybe you know, a rapidly learned behavioral response? Uh, I think it's one of the, uh, the, the big mysteries we've got uh, left to solve. But uh, we're, I think we're making a little bit of progress on it. I can bet until my light has turned off, so I'm completely in the dark here. <laughs> so one of those oil um, turn off lights? Yeah, I guess I'm not moving enough, and now it's too late. <laughs> um, actually, I do have one question for you, Ioana. Um, yes. So do you think, so the virgin, uh, the virgin mice are watching the mum mice behind the screen and, and then learning how to retrieve. Do you think they're imitating the mum, or do you think, alternatively, does observing the mum, uh, the, the mums doing the retrieval activate some innate, maybe not innate, well, maybe activate some <laughs> innate program mm -hmm. so that they now can do it? Or is it some other ways of, uh, like, how does this work, do you think? Yeah, um, I think at this point we didn't collect enough evidence to, to say one thing or another. We, we definitely need to uh, pursue these experiments and... Naomi in uh, in Rob's lab is actually taking taking this uh, observation uh, phenomenon to to a new level. Uh, maybe it's going to be the subject. Naomi to... Lopez Carballo, she's the second author. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so she, you know, maybe this will be the subject of uh, another podcast. But um, y you know, I, I if I had to guess and speculate. Um, I would say it's probably the the later. I would think we're talking here about a form of social learning that's um, that's called object or local enhancement, where basically um, what happens is we draw the or the mother draws the attention of the virgin towards the pop, any pop, and uh, that will sort of. Um, um, start a ca cascade of, I'm sorry, um, neuromodulatory uh, mechanisms in the brain that will basically just draw the attention of the animal to what's happening. You know, a pup is isolated, crying. Oh, okay. So how do we stop this crying, right? Maybe that, the, the fact that the crying stops is also a stimulant in itself. Mm. And, and this, um, progressively leads to activation of what could be a more innate mechanism, let's say, um, and uh, will basically release this mechanism and allow the expression of the behavior. That's That would be my guess. And the reason why I say that is that um, from our observations, we don't see the virgin imitating exactly the path or the movements that the dam makes, right? Like, you know, does the dam go to the right and then to the left and then to the pub? And uh, we, we don't see that happening. And also, if we move pups around, put them in different positions in the, in the cage when we test retrieval, that doesn't seem to necessarily affect uh, very much their ability to to learn from mothers. So um, I, I would say the, the second uh, um, option is probably more likely, but it remains to be determined. <laughs> All right. Actually, so... Ah. Yes, go ahead, Tim. Sorry. 
I'm just wondering, uh, so I'm guessing we're closing, but um, before we go, Ioana, so you started your lab in um, 2018, yeah. did you mention? Um, so I'm wondering, uh, what is your lab working on? Oh my God. <laughs> I think very fascinating projects. Uh, some of them are um, a continuation of uh, of uh, this paper, and some some are totally new. Um, um, the one that kind of stems directly from this paper um, started with the questioning. You know how. Why is this uh, shepherding behavior uh, happening? Why do mothers? Put energy into bringing the the virgin back to the nest, and as I mentioned, we we uh, had the hypothesis that the mother is trying to keep the pups warm for longer, um, and so uh, that started a whole series of experiments where we manipulate environmental temperature to see if that changes maternal behavior, and we're now um, <laughs> addressing this question of. Uh, what does climate change do to social behavior? <laughs> because I think it's going to be a question um, that we need to answer soon before we all bake. <laughs> oh, I haven't, or, I have not even thought about that. Yeah, I mean, there's there's fascinating data in, um, you know, animal behavior, criminology studies showing that sudden increases in temperature make uh, humans and other animals more aggressive, for example. So how does that happen, right? Um, maternal behavior, we find changes with the environmental temperature and how exactly does that happen? How is the external information communicated to the social brain networks while, while the body still maintains constant temperature, right? Because we're homeothermic animals. So the the inside of the body, the temperature inside doesn't change, but it's just the outside that changes and makes us change how we interact with each other. And so that's like um, one of the, the projects that uh, we're working on now. And I'm very excited about the preliminary data. And uh, we're, um, I think soon we're going to have a, a pretty neat story about it. Um, and, and the rest of the projects, it turns out, um, seem to be... Uh, related to brain body communication. Um, it's just like how, where the data led us, um, you know, how, uh, how uh, the oxytocin system in the brain could control cardiac function, for example, that's one, one aspect that we're looking at. And the other one, um, how does, um, uh, you know, feeling, you know, there's all this uh, data now with my, the gut microbiome and how it changes social interaction. So we're looking at um, similar aspects, but asking more like, how does a, a bad bug in your gut changes how you interact with others? You know, how, how does being infected with some germ, could be a bacteria, could be COVID, how does that make you change your interaction with others? And uh, what are the circuits that... Uh, support these changes. So these are kind of the <laughs> major projects going on right now. Uh, Robert, let me ask you one last question. So is there any room for this kind of learning via oxytocin in humans? Oh, boy. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's been kind of one of the fun things also about this project is grappling with the question how much of this is mouse behavior versus how much of this is sort of a mouse model for human behavior. Uh, there are no oxytocin learned recordings in humans, nor will there be for a long time. Um, but um, I think, you know, any new parent uh, probably has had a whole bunch of cultural experience with what it means to be a parent be it on movies or TV or you know, extended families. Uh, we're just walking down the street, you can see parents and babies, parents and kids. Um, parents could take explicit classes and teaching, training has been shown to be effective. Even parents who have been neglectful can have those behaviors remediated. Um, and so, um, you know, I, there are other aspects of my lab that are kind of interfacing with the, the human condition more directly. Um, I think for both Iwan and I, it's one of the important aspects and, and obligations 
related to um, being a scientist and working at a medical school, take these things seriously. Um, we actually have a, a, a collaboration on human work, right? Um, that, uh, yeah, it, it's a little bit more remote from this, but, but uh, we were trying to figure out how um, uh, interact, like, yeah, interactive techniques in humans could lead to increased uh, oxytocin release and to improve states of well-being, of social closeness. Um, so uh, we have some uh, papers out already on that, and uh, there's going to be more coming in the, in the future. This is absolutely a lot of project, but just to put out there as a teaser, it's essentially, you know, what's the neural basis of, of drama therapy or any kind of therapy that might involve um, social contact is an important part of um, the therapeutic mechanism, as well as therapeutic training to kind of help people, you know, engage more with, with social interactions. Um, and uh, can we come up with a set of biomarkers, validated biomarkers in the blood, maybe even the saliva, or using, you know, non-invasive like EEG recording to get a sense as to are people connecting? I think it's a fantastic project. It's the one of project. I've, I've just been well, uh, collaborate. collaborate. <laughs> and I suppose, you know, you mentioned TV and all that, but when we were hunter-gatherers, then people watched others raising kids because they lived in groups, right? So kind of yes. like most. Or they get, or they get shepherded. <laughs> they get shepherded, <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, that's no, great. No, I think definitely, like... Uh, you're absolutely right. We we used to live differently back then. We we lived in more social groups than yep, yep. now. Everybody has their own little studio in Manhattan, <laughs> living yep. alone with a when TV. I, <laughs> when I saw when I read this paper, the first thing that popped to my mind was the saying that it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know, yeah. and I think like after two years of social isolation and COVID. Um, I think a lot of my my sister gave birth to a daughter right before COVID hit, and I think it was quite rough um, mm -hmm. babysitting yes. by herself. Interesting. Yeah. And I yes. think a lot of people was affected. All right. Well, that is twin number twenty four. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twin. You can send your questions and comments to twin at microbe.tv. If you'd like to support our work, we are now a nonprofit. Microbe TV is a nonprofit, yes. so you can uh, have your deductions. You can have your donations tax deductible, at least in the U.S. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today, Robert Fremke. Thanks so much for joining us, Robert. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot. And Joanna Karcha, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was great. Pleasure. I learned an incredible amount, and uh, your work is awesome. Just keep it up. <laughs> thank you. Tim, we will. Thank you. Tim Chung is at New York University. Thank you, Tim. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Johanna. That was uh, a lot of fun. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month.